Welcome back to our program, Hollywood Structured. As some of you may already know, our program is designed to help the young people who wish to enter the entertainment field, uh, may be as musician, stand-up comedian, or singers in nightclub work, or in the theater, or in television, or in the film industry. It is also designed to help the parents and the educators of those young people to help them understand their wants and their needs and the pitfalls and the trap they may fall into unless thoroughly acquainted with the inner workings of Hollywood. Today, as usual, we have a special guest, someone who started as a musician, became a writer, a composer, and an actor. Someone I had the pleasure and the privilege to work with for six months. My partner in crime on Young and Restless, Maury Amsterdam. Now, before we speak to Maury, I would like to speak to you today about false expectation. Something called enjoying the process rather than the end result. I'll explain by giving you a story, a true story. I had a young student, very beautiful, very talented, and after a while that she had been studying with me, I was able to secure for her an audition in a feature, a co-starring role, actually. She went three times, and then she did a screen test for her, and she, in fact, got the role. She went on location for eight weeks. However, she then began enjoying the end result before the process of the daily routine of being an actor. The daily routine of growing as a human being, of growing as an actor. What I mean by that is that when she came back, she needed a car because, as I've told you before, Los Angeles is so widespread that you do need a car. But the car that she needed had to be the best, the most expensive car ever. This was for sure. She also needed some clothes, but her clothes had to be bought at the most expensive shops in Beverly Hills. She wanted to buy a house, but was not satisfied with buying a small house as a starter. No, she immediately had to buy a mansion. Now, she didn't get the car, she didn't get the mansion. She bought herself some of the clothes with the money that she had made. When she came back and she started to audition for roles and did not get them, she started to blame everybody around her. Uh, the casting director was stupid, didn't know. Um, the director didn't know he or she what they wanted to do with the role. Um, her photographs were no good, that's why she didn't get the jobs, and so on, and so on, and so on. She did not enjoy the daily process of learning, of growing, of enlarging your views about life. She decided that she didn't need to study anymore. She knew everything, and she quit classes. Well, the tagline to that story is that that young girl did not work for eight years after that. What a waste. What a waste of time. What a waste of talent. Let's go back to our guests. My friend, Maury Amsterdam. Ta-da! <laughs> Maury, you know, we never had a comedian on our show. You're the first one. And I hope you can help the young people out there who... who would like to comedian. Yeah, <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> Incidentally, what you said about, uh, you know, keep working and plotting and learning that way, that's all building up. It's great for you. I have spoken to more successful authors who said they learned more from their rejection slips than from the books that were accepted. And I think that goes for our business just the same. You never know who the person is going to be that's going to turn that little trick for you or be there at the right time. And fortunately for me, I've always been there at the right time. <laughs> so just uh, make a couple of nice friends, and if you meet somebody and you find out that their uncle owns a studio, it's not going to hurt. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Maury. 
let's go back over your life, oh, okay, wow. which has been, yes. Um, I'm doing a book on it, by the way. I'm doing an autobiography yes. called I Remember Me. And I'm doing it in a series of vignettes. And uh, I think it's going to be a good book. Why? Well, I deal with so many important people that I've written for during the years and worked with. And please buy it because the money goes for a good cause. I didn't tell you this. We are buying foam rubber heels for flamenco dancers to save their kidneys. <laughs> Murray, let me get you back online. Go ahead. Okay, let me get you back to your parents. Yeah. Now, you are, like many of the young people who are watching out there, your parents were not born in this country, were they? No, uh, I guess we're second-class second citizens. My mom was born in Tarnoff in Galicia, in Austria, and my father was born in a little town just a few miles outside of Budapest. Of course, in those days, Austria and Hungary were one country. Franz Joseph, I believe, yes. was the emperor. But they managed to meet in this country. My grandfolks turned out to be my grand grandfolks later. My but your, your, your father was a gypsy, right? My father was a gypsy. He played the violin, and it wasn't... He came to this country when he was 19, and he played beautifully, but he couldn't read music. So he got a job in a bookbinding store and to pay for his lessons, and within a short time, he became concertmaster of the Chicago Opera Company. That's a pretty good success story. And uh, then, he, of course, he met my mother and they got married, which is very lucky for me. Yes. See, see. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I weighed about 14 pounds when I was born. You're kidding. No. Uh, and matter of fact, I think I told you, I carried my mother home from the hospital. But Murray, oh, yeah, what else Murray, <laughs> Murray. Yeah. let's go back. Yeah. Let's go back. Okay. Um, now, you live in Chicago, but somehow your family ended up in San Francisco, right? Lucky for me and they moved to San Francisco. I think I was about two years old. I packed up the family. I said, let's get out of these cold winters. <laughs> Did and you have many brothers and sisters? I had two brothers and one sister, whom unfortunately I've lost. But we had a great family life. My father, my mother, they understood my ambitions. I understood their ambitions for me. And we worked it out so that everything turned out just great. So you can say something to the parents, actually, right? Yeah. I think I, I got to say something nice. So many people who are successful never give their parents the, the credit for it. If they did something wrong, boy, they go make a whole big to-do out of it. But I, my parents were just great. I think I told you my, when I graduated high school when I was 14 years old and I was going into college and after about a year and a half in college, I had to leave because I was unhappy. You know, I was about this big and then a year later I shot up to a, Another inch. <laughs> and now, you went to Berkeley, yeah, didn't you not? Yeah, I'm probably the youngest student that, that ever entered there. And my mother said, look, I would like you to become a lawyer. And my father wanted me a concert artist with a cello. But they said, you do what makes you happy. If after a couple of years you find out that show business was not as kind to you as you thought, and that didn't keep you as happy as you thought, you can always you'd be young enough to go back to my idea. <laughs> now, your, your, your brother was already in vaudeville, am yeah, I correct? That's right. He was a musical director for a flash act. And if you're old enough, you'll remember what a flash act was. That was the act at the end of the show where all the performers in the show worked together. And my brother was not only the musical director, but after, uh, I guess almost a year, he was on the road. When he came back to San Francisco, why, uh, his partner got sick. Who did he recruit? Me. I'd never done a joke in my life. I was never the funny kid at school. I was always a cello player in the orchestra. But you didn't start as a comedian, actually. No, I started as a cello player. And actually, the first time, if I remember well, no, the, the my guy wanted to, to fire you because you were not funny. Yeah, that was, we had an act written for us. It was the worst <laughs> thing he ever heard. And uh, he was going to fire us, but because he knew my father and mother, he said, you can stay on for the rest of the week, but no more jokes. They were terrible jokes. No more jokes, he said. And, just piano, and you can sing a song together, and you play the cello. And about the third day, I'm on the stage there playing, and uh, I threw a couple of lines, and they got big laughs. Now, my brother, we get off the stage, he looks at me. He said, where'd you get those lines? And I don't know, I guess I made them up. Well, he said, make up some more. And that's how I got started. And I started writing for other acts on the bill, and I wound up writing for presidents and famous people in show business and you everybody else. You wrote for else. five presidents, do yeah. you not? Yeah. I'll tell you a very interesting story. One day when we're on the Van Dyke show, 
Uh, now, my wife, you know my wife, yes. she knows that I will not write for anybody unless I know them and know the, their style when they're, when they're working. Well, I get a phone call from the, uh, gets with one of the stage hands. He said, hey, Maury, the president wants to talk to you. So I said, the president of what synagogue? <laughs> he said, no, he said, President Johnson. Well, I, I said, hello, Mr. President. I met him through JFK, who was my friend. Yes. And he says, uh, Tuesday, I'm being made an honorary member of the Washington, D.C. Press Club, and I just looked over my acceptance speech, and it stinks. Those were exactly his words. <laughs> so he said, I've taken the liberty of using diplomatic pouch and sent it to you. You should be getting it, you know, pep it up with a few lines and things. Okay. Now I get home, and I said to my wife, you know something? President Johnson called me today. He says he wants me to write some jokes for him. So Kay looked up at me, and she said, tell him you don't write for him, you see him work. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Maury, so now you're with your brother and you're on the circuit of California, right? Yeah, I'm just playing now, little weekend dates that we've played in those days. Okay, now, the, the, the vaudeville is very big in New York at that time. Yeah. Right? Did you end up in New York? Not till a lot later. When I was working with my brother, when he decided he was going to go back to music, my mother said, there's no vaudeville in San Francisco, you've got to go east. Well, to my mother, East was Chicago, not New York. Why? Because Grandma lived there, <laughs> and she knew that at least I'd have something to eat. See? So that's where I went. And I got started around there, and a fellow by the name of Bob Hope helped me a great deal. He, what was he doing at the time? He was the house MC for a theater called the Stratford Theater out on 63rd and Halstead. By the house MC, I meant he'd been there for a couple of yes. years. And when he walked out and said, hello, they laughed. So he says, don't let that fool you. He says, learn your craft. He says, you're doing the wrong thing. Get rid of that lousy outfit you're wearing. And he helped me. He even got me his own. Now, what were you wearing? I used to wear a great big shoes with a horseshoe on the bottom and a garter for a necktie. Just a cockamamie <laughs> outfit that they laughed at when I walked out, but that was the end. See? <laughs> but when I worked with Bob, they said, oh, they laughed at everything I did, which was really nothing. He said, don't be fooled. He said, you've got talent, but you've got to learn. And he helped me, gave me some lines, things like that. And uh, I have nothing but respect for him and admiration and great affection. Now, you met somebody also very famous in Chicago. And you uh, did not know who he was at the time, did you? No, he was a fellow by the name of Al Capone. Now, you don't think of Al Capone as a patron saint. But I must tell you, in my case, he was very good to me. I had a job working at a place called Colosimo's, which he owned. And then uh, Mike Potson was running it for him, and his wife ran all the houses of prostitution in Chicago. It was a lovely group, you know. <laughs> and uh, so well, anyway, I'm, I'm working there. I didn't know he was Al Capone. He was introduced to me as Al Brown. And after about six weeks, one day he says to me, I said to him, rather, I said, you really Al Capone? He said, yes, I am. I said, I didn't know you were in the cement business. Well, when I think about it now, he would have probably shot me, but instead he got hysterical. And he had a little place out in Cicero called the Greyhound, where he had a spot out there. Mm -hmm. So he'd send these guys to, to pick me up. He said, the <laughs> boss said, bring your cello, because he wants to. I'd go out and I'd play Italian songs for him, and he'd make Italian food, spaghetti and everything. And he took me fishing on his yacht. And then when he was in Alcatraz, I took the first show, and the only show they'd ever had in Alcatraz out there. So I can only think nice things about him. I know about his background, but that's none of my business. So uh, Okay, let me explain to I'm not running uh, uh, Al Capone <laughs> for president at this time, by the way. This is the way it happened. I know. Let me explain to the young people who may not know, Al Capone was a very famous gangster during the Prohibition. Oh, they Chicago. see all the gangster movies now, The Untouchable. The Untouchables they just had on the That's air. true. You're right. Yeah, they You're know right. who he is. And, okay. and they always show him as a great big guy. He was a little guy. Okay, Maury, let's go back. Now you're in Chicago. Mm -hmm. You leave Chicago. Do you come back to California or do you go to New York? No, I came back to California, and I went to work with a radio show called Al Pearson's Gang. Mm -hmm. And I was with Al for five years, and we worked in Chicago, and then we worked in New York. In 1935, that was the first time I had mm -hmm. ever seen uh, New York. And uh, I was with Al for five years, now, you also worked at a studio, did you not? Not at that time. That was oh, later. That was later? That was later, yeah. After Al Pierce, I went to work at MGM as a writer, and it was a big thrill here meeting all these people, especially Tracy's, uh, you know, all, all the top guys out there, Clark mm -hmm. Gable. I used to go out with Clark out to his ranch 
out in the valley mm -hmm. and help them whitewash the fences. And Fanny Bryce, and Fanny and I on Sundays, we used to go out to Malibu and sit on the edge of the pier and fish. She loved fishing. And we never caught anything, I don't think. But she used to <laughs> tell me these wonderful stories about Ziegfeld when she was with him and all. And it was a big thrill to me to be with these people. And now, I you were writing for them, I and was, then you quit. Why did you quit? I, I quit because I was also writing little things. They'd show me a movie in the projection room, and they say, we need a scene to change from this into that, or we need a line here. So, so I had a few lines. I'd go to the preview, and I'd get big laughs on these lines, but they never gave me any credit. Well, to me, happiness is the number one word in the world, and I was unhappy doing these things. And the writers, well, we got contracts with the writers. We have to give them the credit. So I finally quit. And in those days, now I'm going back to 37, 38, 39, I was making $1,250 a week. And that was tremendous, you know. It's still, it's it's still, still a lot of money good, now. Yeah. yeah. And, but I quit, and I went to work as master of ceremonies at the Orpheum Theater in downtown Los Angeles for $250 a week. And I was there a couple of years and really enjoyed it. My salary kept going up, and it all worked out fine. But I'll never forget, everybody thought I was an idiot to, to, to quit, quit that there. job. Okay, now, but you, you saw a door and you took it, and that's, yeah. that's something that the young people should know, is that... It's something I learned. You know, I learned to write with for important people. I learned to take scripts and, and pat them and fix them up. I learned when I went down as MC at the theater there, the things that people in an audience really liked. When, they, when a celebrity like a Jack Benny or somebody would come down, I learned what they want to hear from them. You know what they want to hear from famous people? Like I was writing a, a personal appearance sketch for Jimmy Stewart, and he wanted to go out and play the accordion. He's a wonderful accordion mm -hmm. player. I said, you can't do it, Jimmy. You cannot go out and just play the accordion. You've got to do, you've got to be the fellow that they know in pictures. That skinny little guy, and everybody wonders how he got on a football team. And I wrote an act for him, and he went out, and he did great. He's, to this day, we're very good friends. I said, then you say to the audience, uh, you, look, you look around and you say, you know, my hobby is playing the accordion. I'm not too good, but I, you mind, would, would you like to hear it? Well, of course, the audience, and he went out, played a couple numbers and killed them. But there was a reason for it. It's like any, any part of show business. You find the thing that you're the most adept at, and right away, that's the thing you want to do. Learn a little about something the other guy does. Learn okay. from everybody. All right, that's very good. Uh, Maury, so now you are back in New York, right? Yeah. How did you get the Dick Van Dyke show? Because I'm sure everybody has seen you on the Dick Van Dyke. It's running every day. Five years I was on that show, and that happened on account of Rose Marie, whom I've known since she's 12 years old. I've written everything she's done. And one day when they were casting the Dick Van Dyke show, everybody was cast except the part of Buddy. Now, who a, was on the Dick Van Dyke show at that time? Well, there was uh, Richard Deacon. He was a bald-headed yes. guy. And little uh, Richie, who played Mary's boy. Mary Tyler Moore was Dick's wife. And uh, Rose Marie and, and uh, Dick were the writers. But there were three writers in the office. They said, we need a guy who knows the jokes, who can write, who can do these things. And Rose Marie happened to be sitting there. And she said, how about Maury Amsterdam? Carl Reiner said, oh. I should have thought of him first, and he called me in New York, and it's the truth. We had had a snowstorm the day before, and I was digging my car out of the snow. And when Carl said to me on the phone, you think you could get out here and do a pilot with us? I said, I'm leaving in five minutes. Anything to get out of this weather. So that was the story. We went, we did the pilot, and the show was a tremendous success, and rightfully so. Now, you, sh you shot it uh, with three cameras, That's right. right. And it was new at the time. It was new. The only ones who had done it up to that point were Lucy and Dick Van Dyke. And we were the third group. And the reason it not only saved time, but it was a, a, a really a wonderful way to do a show. Because sometimes we used five cameras, you know, an IMO and I, mm -hmm. to get shots of the audience. Mm -hmm. I, I did a show someplace, and the guy took, was taking shots of the audience during intermission when we, nobody was working. And he was going to, I said, you idiot, you got to take it, we're, we're getting the laughs of the thought. <laughs> well, anyway, the, the three camera job, there's, uh, well, the, For the long the, shot, right? The, the long shot, no, the master shot. Yeah, oh, guy yes. gets the entire shot, and the other camera gets the three quarter shot and the close up. And then they got all of these three of these monsters on the IMO, you know, I yes. mean, not the IMO, what do they call like, yeah, the monsters when they, when they check the. Uh, the moviola? Yeah. The moviola? Yeah, Moviola. Oh, my golly, you're right. <laughs> Moviola. And uh, he puts it all together. And we had a guy who was very, very good. 
And of course, Carl Reinhardt looked over his shoulder, and Johnny Richard looked over his shoulder. They were great guys, wonderful people to work with. When, when we finished doing the Van Dyke show, I wrote a letter to Carl Reiner, and I wrote a letter to Johnny Rich, and thanked them for the education. And personally, I want to thank you for the education on Young and Restless, because I had never not only worked in a uh, soap opera before, I'd never even seen one. And you really kept me going. <laughs> thank you, Mark. Actually, do you want to explain the difference, um, what the work entails on a soap opera, to the young people who might be interested? Well, it's nothing except you got a lot of learns to line. And they, they, they see it, well, if you've never seen a soap opera and you've seen L.A. Law, you know how they, I think the Italians were the first to do that, where they take various sections and, inter, and, and somehow or other they all seem to kind of get together somewhere along the, the story line. The storyline, you mean? Yeah, the storyline. Story line. But uh, you don't have to learn the entire script because when I went in the first day, <laughs> and Bill Bell showed me this script, looked like a telephone book. Wow, it's every day? Ridiculous. But it's all worked out pretty well, and I owe most of my success on the show to this gal sitting right here. Partners in crime, right, yeah, Maury? Yeah, I was a benevolent <laughs> gangster. <laughs> um, okay. You, you composed also, did you not? Yeah, well, being a musician, I've written songs, but I've been lucky enough. I wrote a song called Rum and Coca-Cola, was probably the biggest song to come out of the war. You remember the war with the papers and everything. <laughs> I wasn't in the service. I had a heart murmur. My heart kept murmuring, don't go, don't go. <laughs> but I, I went, what I did do, I wasn't in the service, but I traveled to maybe every one of the theaters of war doing shows. And that was probably one of the most gratifying things that ever happened to me. Because as you recall, in those days, guys who were in different places of the world in the service could not tell their parents or their wives or loved, loved ones where they were. They could always give them just a P.O. number. Oh, really? Yeah. And, and they would write, and I'd, I'd go out, and invariably some guy or two or three guys or a dozen guys say, hey, you can go through New York on the way back? Call my mother. Here's her phone number. Well, when I came home, I made 400 telephone calls, and the most rewarding calls I ever made. My, I used to walk around with a lump in my throat. How does he look? Does he have a mustache? To this day, I run to some of those ex-service guys who say, hey, thanks for calling my wife. And now, you're still making public appearances all the time, Oh, right? yeah, I play Vegas, Tahoe, Reno, uh, Atlantic City. I don't know, I just like to keep working. Somebody said to me, uh, do you ever think of retiring at your age? And I said, no, I haven't got time to retire, number one. And number two is I keep a copy of the Forbes edition of the, in the main copy in there, it lists the 400 richest men in America. And when I look at it, if I don't see my name on the list, I go back to work. <laughs> <laughs> Murray, you, you have done almost everything. Have you ever thought of directing and or producing? Well, for somehow, I think that that's kind of a thing that all actors do it. You do it. I do it. Everybody we work with says, hey, why don't you do this? And, well, in a manner of speaking, that's directing. But uh, just a few little things on the stage and some things I put together. I had a Broadway show in 1948, and I did all the directing of the show. What was uh, the name of it? Hilarities. And uh, I had some great people in the show. But uh, I don't know. I've, I, I see guys like John Capra and uh, some of those guys, their work is that study. And they didn't learn it like that. They worked at it, and they saw what they did. They were lucky enough to look at the screen and say, why did I direct it that way? But if you want to become a director, if you want to become an actor, one word, patience and work. And study A little bit of luck, although I told you that Premier mm -hmm. uh, and Trudeau in Canada once, I heard him at just dinner, and he got up and he said, he mentioned the word luck, and he said, uh, you know what luck is. That's when preparation meets opportunity. So take your time getting ready for it. You know, it's interesting because it's exactly what we talked about on our last show, when preparation meets opportunity. Well, that's where you get your timing from, from everything else. And it's a kick in learning it. And when you accomplish it, you say, hey, yeah, I did that pretty good. I, I get a kick out of the, the watching the, the, the running of our show. And I'm, I'm kind of proud of myself in a lot of, a lot of the scenes. And mostly they were you coming over to me and saying, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Murray, you, you were telling us earlier that young people who think that they can um, tell jokes 
should use every opportunity. That's right. You see a like drunk, what, for example? You see a guy stand on a street corner, or your mother has a card game. Whenever you, somebody is, looks like they need a joke, tell it to them. Even if they don't need a joke, tell it to them. You make them happy, and you make yourself happy. And meanwhile, you say, oh, I shouldn't have told them that joke. You learn by experience. It's wonderful. Would you say that the young people should write their own material, or could they have if a If they have the talent for it. The ones who don't have the talent but are good at it are comedic actors. The others are comedians, the people who write their own. I the see. Difference. But there, there is no way that someone can become a stand-up comic and having somebody else like you write their That's jokes. That's what I said, they're comedic actors. I will write the material for them. But I have to see it first, how they work, how they, how they approach a joke. There's some words are so very important in the telling of a joke, in the telling of a punchline, and that you can learn by looking at other comedians and don't sit there and say, gee, I didn't think that was a funny joke. Maybe it was a funny joke for another audience, but you have to judge that yourself, and you only learn to judge yourself by patience and time. You know, I just realized something that you said. It happens also with comedians. It happens with, uh, I'm a director, and sometimes I get, I'm in love with a frame. Yeah. And the producer said, get rid of it, get rid of it. Uh, an actor is in love with one line. Yeah. And the producer said, get rid of it, we don't need it. But you become in love. So the same thing happens with a comedian. You may be in love with a joke when you first start, and it doesn't work. But because it's your joke, you keep it on. Is that correct? Well, maybe you told it to your brother who laughed at anything anyway. <laughs> 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 That's true. Don't, don't depend too much on the family, just unless you think that they've got a good sense of humor. My mother had a wonderful sense. She always walked in the house laughing. Something funny was always happening. And when we were sick, she was a good mimic. She used to imitate the neighbors. I have not only great love, but great, great memories of my mom. And my dad was, his whole life was music and his family. Outside of that, the rest of the world could go by. Maureen, we only have one minute. We yeah. need to wrap up. Would you like to say something either to the parents or to the educators or to the young people? Well, I think I've said it in a way, and that is patience in trying hard. Don't try to get to the top and be the head man right away. Learn. Learn by looking at other people's work. By looking to, yeah, I wish I should have said it like this. I should have said it. You can only try and judge. You, did you ever have, you must have run into actors who tell you, I never watch myself on television or on the screen. I think they're idiots. How else? <laughs> a guy, a guy, golfers even watch themselves on the screen. He says, I don't know why I did that. So that's it. All right. Thank you, Murray, for what sharing What I do with now? Us. I'm just having a good time. You are having a good time. You see, Murray enjoys the process of life on a daily basis, not just the financial benefit that it could rip out of it. Murray should be a very good example for you. Now remember, young people, keep watching us, because we keep watching out for you. Thank you. Till next time.